So proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the Thank you. Please be seated. Please welcome to the stage UB President Satish K. Tripathi, Acting Chairman of the SUNY Board of Trustees, Merrill H. Tisch, and SUNY Chancellor Christina M. Johnson. Good morning and welcome to the University at Buffalo. And thank you, Sarah, for the beautiful rendition of the National Anthem. The first day of class is always an exciting one at UB, but this is truly an incredible way to kick off the school year. Thank you all for joining us for today's SUNY Honorary Degree presentation and discussion with the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I know I speak on behalf of the entire UB community when I say how honored and delighted we are to welcome Justice Ginsburg to campus. <clears throat> Today's event is truly historic as it marks the first time a Supreme Court Justice has received a SUNY honorary degree, and the first time a Supreme Court Justice has visited our campus. <clears throat> Every day, public research universities like UB address key social issues that impact our communities locally and globally. We do this through the scholarship and research of our faculty who are actively shaping these conversations at the national and international level. We do this by preparing our students to lead as thoughtful, engaged, and informed citizens of our 21st century world. We do this by fostering a culture where people of all backgrounds can come together to explore, discuss, and debate issues and ideas of consequence. And today, on this first day of the academic year, we do this by welcoming a profoundly influential Supreme Court Justice to share her perspective on her remarkable life and career. Thank you all again for joining us for today's historic visit of Justice Ginsburg. And it is now my pleasure to invite to the podium Dr. Maril Tish, Chair of the SUNY Board of Trustees. Mar Good day to all of you, President Tripathi, and of course the faculty and staff of the University of Buffalo, parents, students, and our great chancellor. My fellow trustees who are here today, the dean of our board, Eunice Lewin, please stand. Joe Bellock, a graduate of the University of Buffalo. 
Law School, Gwen Kay, Christy Fogel, Austin Ostrow, and Courtney Burke. Ladies and gentlemen, they serve, these trustees serve an entity known as the State University, serving 1.4 million students, the largest comprehensive public higher education system in the country. Justice Ginsburg, you honor us with your presence. I come from a tradition where we stand in the presence of our teachers. I am humbled by being here with Justice Ginsburg and all of you on this occasion. Justice, your reputation for legal scholarship, litigation, and jurisprudence is not an exaggeration. For myself, I would like to briefly share a story that I have dined out on for years. Several years ago, I had the honor of being seated near the late Justice Antonin Scalia. Not being a legal scholar, I asked him, what is it like behind the scenes of the Supreme Court? Without missing a beat, he regaled me of his friendship with you, Justice Ginsburg. He spoke of shared nights at the opera, bridge hands, bridge tables, New Year's Eve celebrations. Justice Ginsburg, we live in a complicated moment. I will leave it to others to discuss your great decisions. I will focus on what you have taught me. Through your working relationship with Justice Scalia, you have led by example how you can act as one in your reverence for the court, act as one in your reverence for the rule of law, act as one as you honor our Constitution. Though divided and sometimes deeply divided in opinion, you are working colleagues and treasured friends. Justice Ginsburg, your honor, you are an opera-loving rock star with, <laughs> with much left to teach and say. You have enriched us with your teachings. You, your honor, lead by example of what it means to truly make America great. And As I turn this podium over to our chancellor of this great system, I end as I began. Be still my beating heart for being here with all of you today, for the opportunity you give to all of us justice by allowing us to honor you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you be granted the most precious gifts of life, health, and happiness. And may we as a community of great Americans celebrate with you in a world at peace. Thank you, <laughs> Chancellor. Thank you, Chairman Tisch, for those wonderful words. And President Tripathi, thank you for hosting this wonderful ceremony. As the Chancellor of the nation's largest comprehensive university system, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you and to take part in this very special ceremony honoring Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg for her lifetime of achievement and devotion to equal justice under the law. I'm particularly proud of our SUNY family here in Buffalo, the SUNY Board of Trustees, the administrators, faculty, staff, and students for extending the invitation to Justice Ginsburg, and we are honored by her acceptance. Justice Ginsburg, I am a woman who benefited from the sacrifices from generations made, from your generation made to pave the way for future generations of women to be able to pursue any profession of their choosing. Thank you for the hope you have given to countless individuals you will never know or ever hear from, and who, like me, and all those here today, find inspiration in your quiet dignity, your moral clarity, and your determination to uphold the rights of all people to fulfill their God-given talents. In spite of the limitations society tried to place on you and your professional pursuits because of gender, you became the first woman tenured and the first female full professor at the Columbia Law School. You founded and served as general counsel for the Women's Rights Project of the American Civil Liberties Union, a position from which you argued six cases before the Supreme Court 
five of which resulted in landmark decisions on gender equity. Your insight, broad vision, that gender discrimination harmed women and men, as well as your courage, fortitude, and sheer tenacity carried the day. Appointed by President Clinton as the 107th Justice to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1993, Justice Ginsburg continued to fight for the essential dignity and independence of all individuals, including women and minorities. Justice Ginsburg also positively impacted higher education when she wrote the court's majority opinion in the United States versus Virginia, a case that challenged the exclusion of women from the all-male, state-supported Virginia Military Institute. Writing in her typical graceful and eloquent prose, Justice Ginsburg said, this opinion does mark as presumptively invalid a law that denies to women equal opportunity to aspire to achieve, participate in, and contribute to society based on what they can do. The late conservative activist Phyllis Shafley was highly critical of the justice writing, and I quote, her radical feminist goals into the Constitution. Well, I for one want to thank Justice Ginsburg for those radical feminist goals. I could go on singing the praise of this ever graceful woman who on the strength of her integrity, legal acumen, humility, and unwavering commitment to the highest principles of our democracy and constitution has become a larger than life pop icon, affectionately known as the notorious RBG. Justice Ginsburg, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for all that you have done and will continue to do to make our nation more fair and just for everyone. It is with honor and pride that we welcome you as the newest member of the SUNY family. We will now confer the honorary degree. SUNY honorary degrees proposed by our campuses and approved by the State University Board of Trustees represent the highest form of rec recognition accorded by the State University of New York. These degrees are conferred upon individuals of exceptional distinction whose achievements and contributions serve as inspiring examples to university students, the university community, and the SUNY system more broadly. We are honored to have this opportunity to confer this degree on Justice Ginsburg. By the authority of the trustees and the chancellor of the State University of New York and the council and the faculty of the University of Buffalo, I now confer upon Ruth Bader Ginsburg the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, with all the rights and privileges thereto pertaining. In token thereof, I present this diploma and direct that she be vested with the hood appropriate to the degree. This, this occasion is both a joy and a sorrow for me. A joy because a bright and caring young man in the class for Lone Line 
at Cornell University, Wayne Wiesbaum, was both a strong supporter of the University of Buffalo and its law school, and a prominent member of the Western New York legal community. A sorrow because Wayne did not live to be with us today. In July 2018, Wayne wrote to me that his health disabled him from playing a lead role in the arrangements for my visit here, but he still hoped to attend all the events. He asked me to confirm that I would come to Buffalo in August 2019 in any event. I did so immediately, and I did not withdraw when my own health problems presented challenges. Wayne was the very best of lawyers, the least self-regarding, the most dedicated to the well-being of the people, organizations, and communities he served. Although he is no longer in our midst, we remember Wayne with affection and esteem for all the good he had done. It was beyond my wildest imagination that I would one day become the notorious RBG. <laughs> I am now 86 years old, yet people of all ages want to take their picture with me. <laughs> Amazing. If I am notorious, it is because I had the good fortune to be alive and a lawyer in the late 1960s, then and continuing through the 1970s, for the first time in history, it became possible to urge before courts successfully that equal justice under law requires all arms of government to regard women as persons equal in stature to men. In my college years, 1950 to 1954, it was widely thought that women were not suited to many of life's occupations, lawyering and bartending, military service, foreign service, driving trucks, piloting planes, policing, serving on juries, to take just a few of many examples that now seem utterly senseless. It was exhilarating to help bring down the barriers that, in Justice Brennan's words, put women less on a pedestal than in a cage. True, we have not reached nirvana, but the progress I have seen in my lifetime makes me optimistic for the future. Our communities, nation, and world will be increasingly improved as women achieve their rightful place in all fields of human endeavor. At a reception some years ago, a college student asked if I could help her with an assignment. She had one question and hoped to compose a paper by asking diverse people to respond. What she asked, did I think, was the largest problem for the 21st century. My mind raced past privacy concerns in the electronic age, terrorist threats, deadly weapons, fierce partisan divisions in our legislature and polity. I thought of Thurgood Marshall's praise 
of the evolution of our Constitution's opening words. We the people Those words came to embrace once excluded, ignored, or undervalued people, people held in human bondage, Native Americans, women, even men who own no property. I thought next of our nation's motto, E Pluribus Unum, of many, one. The challenge is to make or keep our communities places where we can tolerate, even celebrate our differences while pulling together for the common good. Of many one is the main aspiration. It is my hope for our country and world. With huge appreciation for the degree just awarded me, I am proud to be affiliated with the University of Buffalo and its law school. Thank you so very much. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Justice Ginsburg. My name is Aviva Abramovsky, and I am proud to be the Dean of the University of Buffalo School of Law. This has been such an exciting day for all of us at UB, and as President Tripathi mentioned, what a wonderful day for our university community to launch UB's 2019-2020 academic year. Justice Ginsburg will be returning to the stage momentarily. In the meantime, I will share with you a few details about what's going to happen next. In just a moment, we're going to have the privilege to hear more from the justice herself as she and I sit down for a conversation touching on a range of issues relative to her trailblazing career and life. I know we are all looking forward to learning more about Justice Ginsburg's perspectives, so please sit back, enjoy our program. At this point, I believe the justice is ready to join us. I must admit, this is a very exciting moment for me. My mother is in the audience. <laughs> As many of you know, my father graduated from here, so I'm really happy. My first question is, so you're a uh, native of Brooklyn. You attended Cornell as an undergraduate in Harvard and Columbia Law Schools. I'm curious about your path to law school in particular, how you decided you were interested in a career in the law. I decided to become a lawyer thanks to a great teacher I had at Cornell, Robert E. Cushman professor of government. I attended Cornell from 1950 to 1954. It was not a good time for our nation. It was the heyday of Senator Joe McCarthy, who saw a communist in every corner. People were being hauled before the House on American Activities Committee and the counterpart Senate Committee they were quizzed about some organization they had belonged to in the height of depression when they were students. 
Professor Cushman impressed on me that our nation was straying from its deepest values. That is, we all have the right to think, speak, and write as we believe, and not as a big brother government tells us is the right way to think, speak, and write. So I had the idea that being a lawyer was a pretty nifty thing to do. <laughs> you could earn a living, I thought, and at the same time, do something to help make your society a little better. So that's when I decided to go to law school. I also had the good fortune of having a best friend and husband for 56 years, who was a year ahead of me at, at Cornell. And we decided that whatever we would do, we would do together. Medical school was ruled out because chemistry had labs in the afternoon, and that interfered with my husband's golf practice. <laughs> <laughs> so then there was the possibility of business school. For some reason, Marty wanted to go to Harvard. The Harvard Business School did not admit women in the 50s, not until the mid-60s. So there was law school. And it turned out to be a very good choice for both of us. I think that's true for all of us. Uh, <laughs> so. Western and central New York are the, were the home of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and other inspiring women in the suffragist movement. You have inspired so many people as an advocate for women's rights. Nationwide, we are about to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, providing men and women with equal voting rights. Is there a woman who has inspired you to action and who otherwise influential as you progress in your career? In my growing up years, I can't say that I had a role model of, of women in the law because women were barely there. But I did have two inspirers. One was real and the other fictional. The real model was Amelia Earhart, yes. who was doing something that women just didn't do in her day. And the, the fictional character was Nancy Drew, <laughs> who was a doer, an actor, and she led her boyfriend uh, to, to be her partner in solving crimes. But as I grew up and became a lawyer, there were some very brave women that whose, whose life it, encouraged me. And one is a woman named Belva Lockwood, who in the year 1876 applied to be admitted to the bar of the US Supreme Court. Her application was turned down six to three for one reason, she was a woman. But Belva Lockwood was not the type to go off in a corner and cry about her sad fate. Instead, she lobbied the Congress relentlessly for three years, and in the year 1879, Congress passed a law that said, women who possess the necessary qualifications must be admitted to the Supreme Court bar. It's my favorite example of how sometimes the legislature is more in tune with changing times than the court. In any case, Bella Lockwood wasn't satisfied with becoming a member of the bar. She did argue a case her very first year as a member. She was well into her 70s when she argued her last case 
It was on behalf of the Cherokee Indians who had been dispossessed from their ancestral land in Georgia and marched as a trail of tears to Oklahoma. Belva Lockwood ran for president twice, in the year 1884 and 1888, uh, in something she called the Equal Rights Party. People were astonished. They said, how can you run for office? You can't even vote. <laughs> and she said, <laughs> and she took out her pocket constitution and said, there's nothing in here that says I can't be president. So she was one uh, really inspirational character. Another is when I was appointed to the DC Circuit in 1980, the first woman ever appointed to a federal district court judgeship, Bernadette Sheldon Matthews, was still alive. She was well into her 90s. She was losing her eyesight and her hearing was not very good, but her brain power was undiminished. I met with her from time to time, and she told me wonderful stories about the not so good old days when she was counsel to the National Women's Party, National Women's Party. That was the group that split off from the main branch of the suffrage movement, the group that said, we're not satisfied with the vote. We want equality in all dimensions of life. And so the, the National Women's Party introduced the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923 and every year thereafter. The National Women's Party had its headquarters on the site where the Supreme Court now stands. Uh, Bernita Shelton Matthews was a specialist in eminent domain. And when the government condemned the land to build the Supreme Court, she said, this is a very valuable property and we should get a substantial award. The government argued it was just a ramshackle old building, not worth very much. When Peter Shelton Matthews called as a witness, a member of the older inhabitants of DC, um, who said he, he, he recalled that the building had, had been used as a jail for notorious Confederate spies. The government would have none of that. So then she introduced a photograph of a notorious Confederate spy who happened to be a woman mm -hmm. inside that building. At that point, the government's case collapsed and Bernita Shelton Matthews got for her client, the National Women's Party, the largest condemnation award that up to then had ever been paid by the US government. She, would, she was going to law school at night while working during the day, and she was taking part in the protests in front of the White House. So she would go there and hold up her sign, Votes for Women. She said she would never allow the police to, to elicit a response from her. She didn't speak a word because she didn't want to risk her membership, becoming a member of, of the bar by having any kind of arrest record. She was a woman from Mississippi with a soft Southern drawl, but she was a woman of Steel. When she was on the district court, U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, she engaged only women as her law clerks. And when she was asked why, she said, because my colleagues don't engage any women. 
and she maintained that she always had the best law clerks in the building. Well, um, I, your groundbreaking career has included serving as co-founder of the ACLU's Women's Rights Project, as an attorney for the ACLU, and as an academic and scholar who published extensively on sex discrimination. Where did your passion for social justice come by? I spoke earlier about Professor Cushman at, at Cornell and the notion that lawyers could make a difference. Lawyers appearing with their clients before the investigating committees and reminding our Congress that we have a First Amendment that guarantees freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. We have a Fifth Amendment that protects us against self-incrimination. And then from experiencing odious discrimination. <clears throat> I grew up, I was in grade school during World War II. We were fighting a, a war against racism. And yet, there was an irony because our own troops, almost to the end of the war, were rigidly separated by race. I think the Holocaust was an, an important step in bringing about the end of apartheid in, in America. I think the, when Brown v. Board finally came before the Supreme Court, the government filed a brief urging that we are embarrassed by the Soviet Union calling us racist. Please, Supreme Court, end enforced separation of the races in schools. And then, as I said just a few minutes before, at the end of the 60s, <clears throat> when it became possible to achieve what women had sought from Abigail Adams on. When society was ready to listen, when courts were ready to listen. Mm -hmm. What an exhilarating time that was for me. We had a list of all the provisions of the US code that differentiated on the basis of gender. And those were our targets. Inside of a decade, almost all of those differentials had gone. So, in a sense, we had an easy target. It was, there was nothing subtle about it. It was women are this way and men are that way and never the twain shall meet. Women took care of the home and children. Men earned the bread for the family. So being part of that effort, as I said before, was thinking about the women in the prior generation who had said the same things we were saying. One woman, I hope people in this audience will recognize her name because she was a, a real path breaker. Her name was Pauline Murray. She was on the ACLU board and we overlapped on the board. She had gone to Howard Law School in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. She organized the students at Howard to sit in at the local lunch places because they refused to serve African Americans. This is in the 40s, long before the sit-ins of the 60s. 
She had gone to Hunter College in New York, and she was taking a white friend of hers back to North Carolina to visit her family. They cross the Mason-Dixon line, and she is told to go to the back of the bus. She refuses. She's arrested. Again, this is in the 1940s, long before Rosa Parks. She is finally getting the recognition that she deserves. There are two very good biographies of her. There's a residence at Yale. She had her um, Doctor of Laws degree from Yale that has been named after her. The name of a slave owner was removed and Pauli's name was substituted. So she was one of the people instrumental in persuading that the, the ACLU that gender equality should be on every human rights agenda. It's impressive. So you've taken us from the suffrage movement to Seneca Falls, to civil rights, and I'm gonna ask you now about the case that Chancellor Johnson mentioned. Um, you've become renowned for arguing against limitations on the basis of sex, and in 1996, in the US uh, versus Virginia decision involving the Virginia Military Institute's as missions policy excluding women, you wrote that full citizenship for women requires equal opportunity to aspire, achieve, participate in, and contribute to society. Looking ahead and through the lens of law, what do you mean by that, and what else needs to be uh, done in this regard? Uh, first, as a preface, may I say why I stopped using sex mm -hmm. and started using gender. There was a secretary I had at Columbia Law School who said, I'm typing these briefs and these speeches for you, and the word sex juts out all over. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know that the audience you are addressing, their first association of the word sex is not what you want them to be thinking about. <laughs> so she suggested, use a grammatical term, use gender. It will ward off distracting associations. <laughs> so um, now, <laughs> The question you asked. <laughs> <laughs> it is distracting, yes. On the v Virginia Military Institute oh, yes, case. Yes. Yeah. You're so, <laughs> it was something revealing about the title of that case. It was the United States against Virginia. Mm -hmm. It was the US government telling the state of Virginia you cannot have an educational opportunity and making it, make it available to one sex and not the, not the other. There was a predecessor to the Virginia Military Institute case, and it was a decision that Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote her very first year on the court, so 1982. The case was Hogan against Mississippi University for Women. Hogan was a man who wanted to get a nursing degree. And the best nursing school in his vicinity was the Mississippi University for Women. He was turned down because of his gender. Justice O'Connor wrote a decision holding that the state, that in that case Mississippi, could not deny any person the opportunity for an education solely on the basis of gender. That was the principal precedent for the Virginia Mil Military Institute case. And when the case was before the court, some people said to me, well, who would want to go to VMI with its rat line and its, its very, harsh Spartan quarters. What woman would want to go to such a school? And I said, well, I wouldn't want to go there, but I don't think you would either. 
but there are women who want that opportunity, are fully qualified to survive the rat line and, and any other obstacles. One of the brightest days I had was 21 years after the VMI decision. I was invited to VMI. And the uh, commander was exuberant about the women cadets. These were women who wanted to be engineered, one wanted to be an atomic scientist. It, it was a true success story. Well, one of the reasons why it was such a success is that VMI was able to upgrade its applicant pool very substantially. <laughs> The, the beginning was rocky. VMI's attitude was, we make no concessions for the women. When the men come in, they get their heads shaved, the women too. Um, after a couple of years, they realized that wasn't necessary. <laughs> but the women are leaders of their class. A couple of years later, I visited West Point. The women were elated because they were, had just dropped the combat exclusion for women. Again, women who were fully prepared for that kind of education and wanted to be, to, to climb to the top of the tree. Mm -hmm. So VMI, as it turned out, ended up with only one dissent, and that was my dear friend, Justice Scalia. He wrote a rather strident dissent, but as an illustration of our friendship, he came to my chambers one day and he threw down a sheaf of paper and he said, this is the pen penultimate draft of my VMI dissent. I'm not yet ready to circulate to the court, but I want to give you as much time as I can mm -hmm. to answer it. So I was about to go off to the Second Circuit Judicial Conference in Lake George. I opened the, the dissent on the plane and it absolutely ruined my weekend. <laughs> But I was certainly glad to have the extra days. <laughs> His prophecy that the decision would mark the end of VMI turned out to be altogether wrong. Mm. I think we're going to have to dig deeper with Justice Scalia. Your friendship with him is the stuff of legend. Can you also tell us some other memorable arguments and how do you manage to move beyond them? Oh, well, one of them was certainly Bush v. Gore. Small. When I disagreed strongly with the equal protection rationale mm -hmm. that he signed on to and thought it was uncharacteristic of him, the, the the Bush v. Gore was, a, was an endurance contest. It was the court granted review on Saturday, briefs filed Sunday, oral argument Monday, decisions out on Tuesday. Um, I was still in chambers. It was 9 o'clock at night. The telephone rings, and it's Justice Scalia. Mm -hmm asking, what am I doing still at the court? He said, go home and take a hot bath. <laughs> we sh had certain interests in common. One, we both cared a lot about families. Mm -hmm. We would celebrate New Year's Eve together with whatever children wanted to come along. 
And we shared a passion for opera. Justice Scalia, by the way, was the only one of my colleagues who could carry a tune. <laughs> so the, he had thought for years that Italian opera was what he loved, not German opera. So I said, let's, let's go to the, to the Mets production of Valkyrie and see what you think. Now, it was somewhat of a risk on my part because Valkyrie runs maybe five hours. <laughs> but he was entranced because there's some very beautiful music in that opera. It is beautiful. Um, I have a question for you as a writer. You have been in the public eye for much of your career, and many authors have written about you. What have they gotten right, and what have they gotten wrong? Uh, well, there's, there are now more books than I can count. But the full story will be told by my official biographers, Wendy Williams and Mary Hartnett. And they've been working on this for, oh, I'd say, um, at least 15 years. Um, some of the, the two, two in particular that I enjoy, is one is the children's book, High Descent. Children love it because it tells them it's okay to say no. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts out when I'm in first grade, I'm left-handed, the teacher is encouraging me to use my right hand. I try for, for one test and I get back a D and I said never again. <laughs> I will write with my left hand. I'm going to follow up with you about children. Your image has appeared on t-shirts, on comic books, coloring books, and tattoos. Uh, <laughs> children dress up as you um, for History Day at school. To what do you attribute your popularity to among young people? To a second year student at NYU Law School. When the Supreme Court decided the Shelby County case mm -hmm. that declared unconstitutional the key provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, she was angry. And then she thought to herself, anger is not a useful emotion. It will get me nowhere. I should do something positive. So she took the announcement of my dissent that I read from the bench, and she created a, a tumbler. Tumbler. Yes, and that's, that's how it all began. She called it the Notorious wow. RBG, <laughs> after the Notorious B.I.G., yes. which she said was altogether fitting and proper because after all, we had one important thing in common. We were both born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. Oh. <laughs> and then from that beginning, it just took, yeah. took off into uh, outer space. Well, the home crowd is definitely in love with that story. So I think it's also well-deserved. Sadly, we only have time for one last question um, before we have to end our discussion today. So this is a useful one. We have many law students in the audience, and some of them, I think, aspire to also be judges. Um, so I was hoping if you could ask, what is one characteristic you believe all successful judges share, um, and what type of, it, it, why is that characteristic important? Uh, I'd say, Two. One is patience. Hmm. 
and the other is a willingness to listen and to learn. My recently deceased colleague, Justice John Paul Stevens, was a very good listener. Mm. And he spoke about how much he learned on, on the bench by listening to the advocates, by listening to his colleagues in conference. Compassion is another quality. The law doesn't exist somewhere in the, in the sky. It exists to govern society. Law exists to serve that society. So an appreciation of what law is all about to help keep society operating peacefully. I think it's, it's important to realize that law is not some kind of abstract exercise. It affects real people, and judges should be cognizant of how the law affects the people that law is meant to serve. Very well said. Justice Ginsburg, it has been an honor and a privilege. <laughs>